We already go, time goes fast, we already go to the uh, last speaker, uh, the last introduction, last speech of this conference, and that's the speech, and you see it over there already, of Mr. Harun Sheikh. Uh, he is, uh, as you see, uh, a philosopher, senior researcher at the European Think Tank, Freedom Lab, and strategist at Sirte Investments. And he, Mr. Sheikh, studied philosophy, public administration, and political science in Leiden and in Oxford. Oxford excuse me. And uh, he works, uh, as you see, and as I already said at this moment, at Sirte Investments. And he recently uh, completed his PhD thesis, Embedding Technopolis, at this university, at the Freie Universiteit. Uh, and that was a thesis on the relationship between modernization and traditional culture. And so we have uh, uh, the number four of this day, uh, who is engaged either as a student or of, as a uh, uh, PhD student uh, at this Freie University. And uh, maybe I should uh, say one thing more about Mr. Wilders, because uh, I forgot it, or I didn't dare to mention it, but Mr. Wilders studied at the Universiteit van Amsterdam. <laughs> but the word is to Mr. Harun Sheikh now. afternoon. We're here to have a glance at the future, but I'd actually like to start by going back into the past. In order to understand the fundamental trends of the future, I think it's important to understand the history of where, where we come from, and actually to understand what, we're, what I want to explain to you today, we have to go back way into history, actually start with prehistory. I think that right now we are going through a transition that is so vast that actually to make the comparison and to see it in the right perspective, we need to go back to the dawn of history. It was around 10,000 BC that there was a fundamental transformation in the way mankind organized itself, the way it lived, in the way polities were organized. This transition was called the Neolithic Revolution, and it was a transition in which before that, mankind lived as hunter-gatherers, and afterwards, mankind settled down. Now, where mankind settled down was in the village or on the farm. It is in this sense that we can speak of this transition and the period that happened, that started there, and that lasted until the most recent past, that we can describe as the rural condition. Now, of course, throughout this time that lasted until the recent past, there have been important cities, dominant cities, uh, many very famous throughout history. But what we have to realize is that all these, though these were large cities throughout history, these were cities in the most advanced empires of their age, and they excluded the vast majority of mankind. Moreover, even within these empires, these were just the capitals. Most people within these empires lived on villages, they lived on the land. And it is in that sense that we can say what this condition could be called the rural condition. Now, what do I mean when I say the rural condition, or how can we say that life was characterized as being rural. Here's some examples of fields that developed from mankind's attachment to the land. Rule of local areas was, was done by local lords that developed into the aristocrats of the age. And these aristocrats developed their warrior codes, the warrior codes of samurai, the warrior codes of medieval knights. The arts and crafts fundamentally worked on mankind's embeddedness within nature even though the arts try to make it a bit more comforting and the crafts try to make it more comfortable. The world of the arts and crafts dealt with mankind's relationship in the natural world. It's his attachment to the land. In more advanced polities, we've seen empires arise, large emperor, emperors coming up with their courts uh, around them. And it is these classes that concern themselves with controlling the vast agricultural lands underneath them that the courtly, the courtly classes emerged. And finally, we can say that religions also had to do with mankind's relationship with nature. 
the religions that developed in the rural condition fundamentally reflected the patterns or the cycles of nature in which man was embedded, the cycles of day and night, of the seasons, and life was interpreted through elements of birth, rise, decline, death, and eventually even rebirth. So this is the, the rural condition, and until the most recent past, it dominated mankind's life on Earth. But now we're actually in the midst of a vast transition. The transition started slowly some time ago, but actually at this moment, and in the course of our lifetimes, this transition will be complete, and we will live in a fundamentally different situation. Right now, mankind, as a whole, is settling again somewhere else. Whereas before he settled on the farm, on the village, we are now, en masse, settling mankind in the world's cities. In that sense, we can say we are now moving towards what could be called the urban condition. Now, this is a picture that those present this morning have also seen, but it also illustrates my story nicely. We're seeing the world by night, as, as NASA has depicted it, shows how, indeed, the world is increasingly becoming urbanized. And the light shows that it's not no longer just the West, but increasingly large parts of the world are living in cities. And it is important to understand the vastness of this phenomenon. In 2007, it was the first year in the whole of human history that more than 50% of the world's population lived in cities. In the coming decades, we will complete this transition until about 80 to 90% of the world lives in cities. It's important also to understand the pace at which this is happening right now. Every month, about 5 million people forever leave the rural condition and start to live in some of the world's rising cities. That means that every about three months, we have to create an area that can house the population of the Netherlands. Add in a few more months, and we have to build a city the size of Tokyo. Now let's look at this development a bit closer and see how it's distinguished locally, because there are large differences, of course, in the pace in which this is, help, uh, this is developing worldwide. The developed regions we can see on top have basically been quite stable. The relationship between urban people and rural people in the Western world has been quite stable since the 1950s. It's really within the developing world that this transition is taking place. If we look at 1950, we see that the developing world was largely rural. As recently as midway to the 20th century, develop, develop, being a develop, developing country meant being a rural country. Over time, we've seen the growth of rural areas stop and even go into decline, and it is the rise of, of urban areas in the developing world that has become more dominant. In 1950, about one in seven people in the world lived in a city in the developing world. In 2030, about half the world's population will live in a city in the developing world. Looking at it a bit more specifically by countries, we can see indeed that the pace of urbanization differs widely. As I said, Western countries had this development already a long time ago. The turning point in which 50% of a society lives in urban areas was reached in the US already in 1910. In China, this point was only very recently. 2010 was the point in which 50% of the Chinese population lived in cities. And as you can see here, other areas, India, Southeast Asia, Africa, will follow. Now, it might seem, because we're familiar with this development in the West, that this change that we're going through is not that big. But we have it here, we've been used to it for decades, in some cases centuries here in the West. But it is important to note that because this development is going so fast and on such a grand scale, that the way urbanization is developing now is truly changing hu humanity's condition. I've just here summarized a few trends of the way cities are going to be different in the period that we're in now and in the, in the near future. The first thing, I have several of these themes actually have been come up during the course of this, uh, this conference uh, during the day. Uh, one of the trends we're seeing is the rise of megacities. Cities with more than 10 million people, cities thus bigger than many nations. We're seeing the rise of innovation cities, as cities modeled all on Silicon Valley. Sorry. And attempting to focus on the new technologies. We're also seeing the rise of futuristic cities, cities implanted with all the newest technologies. Think for instance of New Songdo, as a city in Korea in which every single object has a sensor and has a secondary life in the digital world. 
Masdar is a city planned in Abu Dhabi. It's a city that is planned to be carbon neutral. And one of the policies in which this is going to happen is that it is a city that entirely includes cars. And instead, people have to move through a kind of personalized metro system. We're seeing the rise of global cities, cities like New York, <coughs> London, Hong Kong, that are more tied to each other and more have a stronger connection to each other than the country in which they're based. <coughs> Most interesting, actually, is the last category, a, a term dubbed by Doug Sanders of the arrival city. This is basically the city in which the world's rural population will arrive in urban areas. Cities like Sao Paulo, but of course the big cities of China and India, this, these are all the cities that are increasing so vast at this moment and where this rural civilization, rural population is entering. It's important and it's, it's, it's a field we need, to, we need to focus on because there the grand experiment of our time will take place. Will we succeed? in bringing these people into a stable, modern, middle-class society? Or will these become the chaotic, anarchistic places of violence of the, of the many slums that they can easily turn into as well? Now, what characterizes this difference? This, this difference between coming from the rural condition and now going to the urban condition? I think in a fundamental way, our society or the way we relate to the world is, is, is being altered. We could say, as I mentioned, the transition to the rural condition meant that mankind settled on the land, and it is land, the natural environment, that fundamentally characterized human life throughout the rural condition. So thus, if you look at the things that mainly concern us as human beings, it was a struggle with the forces of nature. Hunger was something dominant that dominated not only the minds of people, but also was against many wars and migrations. Natural, desire, natural disasters were, were important in the imagination and the religious mythology of people. Diseases were fundamentally of an infectious nature. It was a nature that was violent, aggressive, and that struck on us like in the form of malaria. And of course, our mobility was hindered by dangerous terrain. So the rural condition was, was characterized by mankind's embedding in the natural world. But what is happening now, and that is something that goes together with the rise of the, of the urban condition, is that a different way of relating to the world has emerged, and this is the way of relating that I've, I've called technopolis. A polis, in the sense of that this is the type of city, but it's a city that's fundamentally informed by a technological way of relating to the world and ourselves. What I mean by technological is that it's a different way of relating where the world no longer is seen as a place that has an inherent meaning, a natural world where everything has its place, mankind also has its place, and he has to attune him to, to, this, to this natural order of meaning. But instead of that, the world is now seen as a totality of objects that man can manipulate and transform according to his own desi desires. To illustrate this, one of my favorite uh, remarks that sheds light on this spirit of Technopolis comes actually from a communist writer who uh, often actually have interesting things to say about the present, Trotsky. And this is a quote from one of his works, and we can replace here, he starts with the world of faith, and we can see the world of faith here basically as what I've described before as the rural civilization. The world of faith, the world of the religions, the rural world. So rural civilization merely promises to move mountains, but technology, which takes nothing on faith, is actually able to cut them down, cut mountains down and move them. Man will occupy himself with re-registering mountains and rivers, and will earnestly and repeatedly make improvements in nature. In the end, he will have rebuilt the earth, if not in his own image, at least according to his own taste. So how do we see this developing in the way we live? How, what exactly does this mean for how, how we relate to our world? So this was indeed mankind's life as it was shaped fundamentally by the forces of nature. And basically in all these fields we're seeing that because of the rise of Technopolis, we have basically conquered nature. And by conquering nature, we're creating a man-made nature, and it is basically the struggle with our own consequences, the struggle with ourselves, that is now taking the prime position in our concerns. So instead of hunger, what, are, what is becoming now the, more, the biggest dietary concern in the world, in the man-made world, it's obesity that's becoming an increasingly large issue. Interestingly enough, in many emerging countries, we can see these problems coexist. Countries like India and Latin America have 
equally large proportions of people who suffer from malnutrition as people who suffer from obesity. And of course, we still have natural disasters, but it's interesting just to note that the way we are focused now on climate change describes that nature is something different for us now. Nature is not just that violent force which we have to deal with or in which we have to find our own place, but it is something that we've meddled with. It's something we've technologically changed, and it's the, the consequences of these actions that is now the way in which we're worrying about the natural environment. And from infectious diseases, we're now making a shift towards lifestyle diseases. Malaria, which until uh, a few decades ago was still present in southern Europe, no longer uh, roams in the world of Technopolis, but it's other diseases. It's diabetes, <coughs> sexually transmitted diseases, <coughs> Alzheimer and asthma. Diseases fundamentally related not with the lack of nature, nature's input, but by the way mankind has manipul manipulated nature and in that sense is now starting to dominate uh, the uh, healthcare concerns of mankind. And of course, instead of dangerous terrain, uh, what we're now, the, the prime impediment to our mobility now is congestion. Um, going as far as reportedly uh, uh, traffic jams in China that last up to 10 days. Now, one way to have a nice glance in the future, for me at least, is uh, uh, reading futuristic author, uh, authors, specifically uh, science fiction writers. Um, not because science fiction writers have the technologies of the future, right? They never do. But what they are capable of is showing certain trends, magnifying them, and showing us a world that is present within current trends of our way, our way of life. So this is an example, a picture of uh, my favorite uh, science fiction writer, Azik Asimov, and how he describes a futuristic world in which an entire planet has become one city. It's already, if we remember the picture of NASA, we're slowly seeing this emerging trend of linking together in vast uh, urban areas. It's a city, moreover, that's in, uh, in this futuristic city, covered entirely by metal, and the people have started to move underground. One of the interesting things in Asimov's uh, books is that he describes that the people of Trantor have developed something that could be called the, the fear of open places. Being so accustomed to living underground and in walled, man-made environments, once they come outside in, a in the open skies, they de suddenly develop a very strong fear of, be of, of being unprotected and the vastness of nature surrounding. Now this might seem a bit futuristic, but it's actually something that you can get quite close to if you go to a city like Las Vegas or Hong Kong. Cities which have been so fundamentally organized by mankind that it's actually truly hard to find out exactly what time of day it is, or what the natural environment, what, what role it still could play. But instead, we've merged completely within this uh, man-made environment. Actually, recently, um, I myself was in the, the desert of Jordan, and I spent a night under the stars in the desert there. And although what I experienced, what experienced wasn't quite the fear of open places, I was struck by the immensity of the change that has taken place. Just the simple fact of feeling and seeing the starry sky above us that actually throughout the rural condition has been the basic condition of mankind did make me realize how fundamentally this natural environment that always surrounds us has been forgotten in the world that we live in right now. So, okay, we have a distinction here between what happens when we transition from the rural to the urban condition. But what happens to rural civilization? I've described before several fields in which rural civilization developed, and the most basic answer that we would probably give is that of course they disappear. And remember the characters I mentioned before, in a very strong sense they have disappeared. The warrior codes, the aristocrats that developed them, have been made superfluous by modern military hardware. The samurai sword, of course, no longer uh, has any uh, military value. The arts and crafts, have been crushed mostly under the forces of mechanical industrialization and the factories of the modern world. Courts and emperors have been washed away by the, by the rise of mass politics. And this Buddhist statue in Hong Kong actually now mostly serves as a tourist site. So in a sense, yes, rural civilization disappears or is, uh, uh, is under threat. But my research actually indicates 
that the situation is more complex than that. In a very strong sense, rural civilization still survives. Not in that traditional way, in that classical way, but in a transformed way. I think I, we can describe that as follows. Basically, we can see culture or rural civilization as having two components, an inner component, component and an outer component. The outer component concerns the material and spatial manifestation of a culture. So this is the sword of the samurai. This is the anvil of the goldsmith. And indeed, these, under the material world of Technopolis, as the urban condition develops, are replaced by the material world of Technopolis. But ci rural civilization, or any culture, apart from this outward manifestation, also has an inner manifestation. And we can see this not as the samurai sword, but as its ethos, or as the Japanese would call it, the way of the samurai. In the form of a traditional craftsman, it may not be his same work that survives, but a certain work ethic or a way of relating to matter and material around him may survive, even though it's the material, the outward context disappears, but in another context it's transformed and then comes to infuse the modern world of Technopolis. And that's something that creates what we could call multiple modernities. Because if rural civilization doesn't disappear, if it manages to transform itself, it means that it can shape the way countries become modern in the technopolitical world. All traditions in different, in new ways still shape the world we live in. Now this sound, may sound a bit abstract, but I'll illustrate this with a few examples. This is the type of graph that many pundits and uh, uh, journalists like to refer to, and it shows the long-term growth rate of China, the blue line, vis-a-vis -vis different developing and developed other countries. What it clearly shows is the way China has outperformed over the long period these other countries. So this leads many people to argue, well, that's interesting. China is doing it in a different way. China, what China has developed is a system of state-led capitalism. So maybe this is a superior model. Maybe other countries around the world should also seek to follow it instead of just following the Western model of open markets. So shouldn't countries in Africa or Latin America actually model themselves in China and maybe achieve growth as fast as China had? I would argue that that would be a mistake, and it's actually impossible to recreate what China has in this area, because the way the Chinese and many East Asian systems work has to do with their rural civilization, the way old traditions and practices still animate their contemporary world. First thing to note is that state-led capitalism is not something that has been invented by China. If we look back a little, we see that actually many countries around the world have tried it before, especially in the middle of the 20th century. Many Latin American countries, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, but even African countries followed a model of state-led capitalism. All these cap countries actually have failed in this, and that's why we've forgotten mostly about it. We have a few examples of successful state-led capitalism. But interestingly enough, all of these examples are in East Asia. Outside China, it's Japan. South Korea, Taiwan, arguably Singapore, countries that have managed to, to, to de develop successfully through state-led capitalism. And I would argue the reason why this is the case is because East Asia, in its rural civilization, was characterized by the strong formation of a state, a state that was capable as well as professional. Think, for instance, of Korea. The Korean state, in the 6th century, already had a large nationwide census. Now, censuses were made in different parts of the world, but in this census, it not just monitored the amount of people in the empire, they also tried to map the amount of trees within the empire. Imagine the administrative capacity necessary to, in the 6th century AD, to, the, to find out the amount of trees within a country. And Korea is just one example. It's in China specifically that the strong, emer the strong tradition of the state emerged. The first time that a large part of contemporary China was already unified was in the second century BC. Under the Qin Dynasty, from which the country probably derives its name, already a large part of current day China was unified under one emperor. Now, empires may be conquered by violence, but they can never be sustained by violence, especially not if they survive over practically two millennia. So a state needs to be in some way more capable, more professionalized, if, if it wants to exist over that long period of time, as it has indeed in China throughout its different dynasties. 
And the way the Chinese state did this was by creating the most capable staff, bringing together the most capable country of the people in the state and making them the top bureaucrats. It meant that all kinds of considerations of birth, wealth, did not matter if you want to go up into the highest ranks of the Chinese bureaucracy. And instead, it were the most capable that led the bureaucracy. And one of the prime ways in which they managed to achieve that, managed to get all kinds of other considerations out, was the Chinese state examination. This is a picture of uh, about how it worked. <clears throat> a very old tradition in China in which students were selected. Basically, everyone who wanted to participate could participate in the state examination. Students would then be locked in these little rooms, sometimes for days on end, and they would be writing. They would be writing essays about the condition of the Chinese empire, how reading the classics could reinvigorate the empire. The exams that these students made, made were never checked by their own teachers. And their teachers were afterwards, uh, uh, the, their teachers were ranked according to how their students did, as other teachers uh, uh, checked the exams of their students. So we have here a system in which all, only professional ethics manage to work through people getting up into the ranks of the bureaucracy. And it's this tradition that has shaped Chinese history. Of course, the Chinese state also had problematic sides, but it is by these kind of institutions that the Chinese developed a different type of state very early on in their history. And it has created a very powerful tradition. Chinese officials, even current day officials of the Communist Party, who do not have much attachment to their traditional culture, stand on a tradition in which bureaucrats have a state responsibility. They are trained, they are checked by the highest standards, and it is that responsibility that also lingers in society. Chinese, of course, they definitely have problems with the way their government works in many ways, but there is also a very deep-seated view in Chinese society that the state is and should be organized according to the good of the people, and that it can be like that. And it's that tradition which makes state-led capitalism in East Asia possible. Other regions of the world, like Latin America, which lack such traditions, will not be able to recreate state-led capitalism if there is not a state that is that much respected and that not that much professionalized as the state has been in East Asia. Let me turn to a second example, maybe a bit closer, because it's not just in Asian countries that old traditions of rural civilization work through in the modern techno-political world. If we look closer, we can see even within the West, we see fundamentally important differences. It was actually mentioned at this conference earlier before, is that if we look at two, two very dominant countries in the West, uh, Germany and the United States, their economies seem to work, they're both adv as advanced as they can be, but the way or the fields in which they're successful are highly different. Before it was mentioned, the German car industry, but interestingly enough, Germany in general has a specific strength in certain fields, which the United States doesn't have, but the United States has a different strength. So, put it in a few questions. Why is Germany specifically very good at complex engineering? It's not just automobiles, it's chemicals, it's infrastructure. If you want an elevator, you want that it's German made. And it's not this so much this field that we will turn to f at the US industry. If we look at the US car industry, it's mostly a field that we hear of in a negative sense. Differently, why actually does the German economy, is, why isn't it not that strong in ICT? And this field, which has changed all of our lives in the last few years, basically is a US industry. Silicon Valley, that drives a large part of uh, the world's innovation, is something that many countries have tried to copy, but none have been able to succeed at. And I would argue that the reason why we still have these differences in economic competitiveness have to do with old, tra old traditions of the rural age that work through in the modern urban age. So what are the traditions that inform German modernity? <clears throat> Interestingly enough, the German strength in heavy manufacturing and heavy industry has to do with the survival of the old medieval guilds, the Trillesystem. Of course, there are no guilds currently in Germany, but interestingly enough, when the modern factory arose, so basically when Technopolis emerged uh, in German society, at the end of the 19th century, the guilds were in many places in Europe, they were destroyed. In England, for instance, uh, companies, labor, uh, labor forces, as well as uh, the state conspired to, to take this old remnant of medieval society and to crush it. 
But in Germany, the guilds actually, they survived. What happened at the end of the 19th century is that the guilds were asked by the state and by uh, organizations of businesses to come and oversee the workforce. The guilds, with their long tradition in education, in providing certificates for, for, for workers, and in creating an order of rank in which people had to work and study and, and get diplomas for that, was actually done by the guilds in the modern factory. It's on this tradition that we actually see German industry developing further and further. Up to this day, we can see that German industry has very strong support from all different sectors in society, and the education system, which basically was put into place by the guilds in an earlier period, still has very strong connections with German business, and the state also facilitates to make sure that the craft level, the level of craftsmanship in German industry, remains that high. And it's that tradition which is why the Germans are so good with their hands, why every heavy thing that they make, it has that German quality to it. The tradition on which the U.S. stand is very different. <clears throat> the U.S. being a country that was founded after the Middle Ages, didn't have a developed, uh, developed system of the guilds as we had here in Europe. Instead, American history was shaped by people fleeing the European system and going into a wild world in which they conquer, had to conquer their frontier. It's in this sense that, that, that the U.S. system did not have a system in which people learned the, the crafts of the guilds and had to follow their masters, but people were much more focused on practical use for their own affairs because they were not in such a strong system as the European system was. So whereas in Europe, a worker was required to learn a specific craft, and it was blasphemous to change from one craft to another and to mix all your uh, different fields, in America, a new type of per personality emerged, which a term was still often used, the jack of all trades. It's actually where it would be a swear word in the European context. context. It is a word of pride in the American context. People who did not f finish their education, people who did not follow through with one specific craft, but who studied different fields and tried to mix them all together for practical advantage as they were set out to conquer the, 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 the savage frontier. The most famous example of this would be Benjamin Franklin, actually. A person often stated as a jack of all trades, a person who was as well as a very skilled politician, a very uh, prolific writer, a scientist, as well as an inventor. So this more practical orientation, this more orientation not towards tradition, but towards conquering the frontier in order to uh, 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 gain prosperity, is a spirit that is that has, has often been analyzed as something that typically defines American society. And I, I believe that this is actually one important reason that helps us to understand why Silicon Valley is in the US and why no one else has actually managed to succeed in copying it. There was an interesting book written in the early 20th century by Frederick Taylor, who described how the conquest of the frontier basically shaped American society. And he showed that at the end of the 19th century, that project was finished. Americans reached the final western frontier in California, they reached the Pacific Sea, so no longer did Americans have to be shaped by this, uh, this, this, this uh, project of going out there individualistically, fighting, uh, finding, uh, being resourceful, being innovative. And what he suggested was that even though this practical, this physical activity of conquering the frontier had been finished, what Americans could do, could do next was to keep this spirit, as I described in the sense of what happens to rural civilization, even though its outward manifestation disappears, the spirit can survive if America injects it into its education system. Conquering the frontier will not be about conquering some land, it will be conquering, about conquering different frontiers, conquering space, conquering the digital frontier. And it's that kind of spirit that we see indeed in the higher educations of the United States, and which is why from these education institutions, a large part of the innovations that have shaped our world, a large part of the ICT sector has emerged. So, what we're seeing is basically, we're, to sum up some different lines of, the, of what I've discussed up till now, we're seeing a global transition from a rural civilization. We are moving everyone now into an urban context. And what that means is that all we've seen that rural civilization is not something that just disappears in the modern context. 